that we're trying to keep moving here real quickly. So let's get started with our first uh, presentation with by Shelby Thomas. Shelby is a graduate student, PhD candidate, and I just got um, something going on here, but she's at uh, the University of Florida. Uh, Josh Peterson is, is, is her uh, major professor, and she's going to be talking about base scallop restoration in Tampa Bay. Good morning, everyone. Last session of the morning, so I'm sure everyone's looking forward to lunch and warming up. But again, my name is Shelby Thomas. I'm a PhD student with the University of Florida at the Center for Conservation in Apollo Beach, so right across the bay here. And today we're talking about bay scallop restoration in Tampa Bay, evaluating larval release as an effective strategy and advised by Dr. Patterson and Quentin Tuckett. Next slide. There we go. So scallops are environmentally and economically important, of course, and have historically had a presence here in Tampa Bay. And as you have known, the seagrass habitat has recovered quite significantly, but scallop populations have not quite mimicked that recovery. And that leads to a potential recruitment limitation that may be present within scallop populations. And this project seeks to really examine these restoration efforts and the relationship between restoration density and restoration success, including recruitment limitations. This figure that you see here on the screen is actually data provided by the Tampa Bay Watch. I know we have some people here in the room, so thank you guys for that. From monitoring annual um, scallop and seagrass distribution from 1995 to 2019, and you can see that sharp recovery of the seagrass population, but again, that scallop population isn't quite mimicking that recovery. You do see this little blip here, which may be attributed to some work of Mr. J right here, potentially, um, who did larval restoration back uh, between 2003 and 2010, with this publication being published in 2010. But it also may have been attributed to some uh, reduced predation potentially within the bay, but either way you can see not, scout populations not quite recovering. Next slide. So I wanted to talk here a little bit about larval release as an effective strategy for restoration. Historically, caged adults and releasing adult scallops have been a solution for restoration. And now releasing settlement competent larvae have become a tool to use for effective scallop restoration. Here on this slide, you can actually see hundreds of little baby scallops under the microscope. That's, so that's a pretty, pretty neat photo. Um, here in Tampa Bay, we actually released five different spawn, independent spawns at five independent locations within the bay that we'll get into. And we used a total of 96 brood stock that were obtained from Honeymoon Island. Next slide. Um, and actually, if we could go back for a moment. So I wanted to talk quickly here on a little bit of a unique component that we added to the study was including parentage analysis. So we connected genetic data, DNA, from each component of, of the study. So from the brood stock, when we first collected them right after spawning, we swabbed them for DNA, then actually collected the larvae prior to releasing them for DNA, and then spat and six month post adult. We'll get into that a little bit later, but utilizing parentage analysis allows us to effectively determine which scallops came from the hatchery post release, allows us to assess their distribution and effective population sizes. So really looking forward to using genetics as an effective tool to assess restoration success. Next slide. So some of the sites we selected based off of ideal salinity regimes and continuous sea, the presence of continuous seagrass habitat within the bay, these are some of our release sites and numbers of larvae that were released at each one of those sites with the largest release being conducted at site one with just over 2 million larvae released and the lowest at release site four, about 270,000 larvae. The predominant seagrass species present was Syringodium, with our last site actually having predominantly Thalassia. And we had actually site selection aid with Steve Geiger with FWC, who's had extensive experience with scallop restoration, as well as knowing the bay very well. So we'd like to thank him for that. Next slide. And here's a schematic of some of our different release sites and the associated average salinities. And at each one of these sites, we had three treatments where we released a high density of 75% of our larvae, a low density, 25% of the larvae, and a control of a no release. Next slide. And each one of these sites were spaced out approximately 1,000 meters apart and randomized. So you can see right here, the three treatments of the low density, 25%. The center was the control of no re release, and the higher part was the high density release of 75% of the larvae. Next slide. 
At each one of these sites and treatments, we released four, we placed four SPAT collectors, which have been used historically by FWC and other universities to really assess SPAT recruitment to specific sites. This is a Vexar mesh inside a citrus bag and has been very effective for recruiting our small baby scallops, which are about the size of your pinky nail. At each one of these treatments, we put out four collectors in a cardinal ray, north, south, east, and west, and checked them about six to eight weeks post and collected those SPAT for genetic analysis. Next slide. Fast forward six months post-release, we then went and surveyed the site using a 100 meter transect and surveying one meter off each side, sending two snorkelers down and back, looking for adult scallops. And we surveyed about 1,200 square meters per survey site release and about 6,000 meters total, square meters total. Next slide. And once we found those adult scallops, we also served, swabbed them for DNA for genetic analysis and brought them back to the lab. Next slide. So we'll get into a little bit of the scallop numbers for each of the release sites. This first release, we had the most scallops released at 2 million. And you can see here, we had 196 bats actually collected in those collectors. Ironically, we had more in the control site, but as we fast forward to site two, we actually had eight spat collected in this collectors. We attributed potentially the first site also had a little bit of natural recruitment suspected as the other sites were not actually traditional for normal uh, scallop spawning. Next. For site three, we actually got no scallops in the spat collector itself. Four. Next slide. And on spawn four, we got about seven. Next. And this on the, the last one, we actually collected 47 spat total, and you can see this last um, notation on the on the bottom is the six month uh, post survey where we collected 40 scallops at the release site one and at site five, 73. And one interesting factor here is seeing that this is not quite what we expected with the density release treatments. In fact, the majority of the control sites actually had higher spat recruitment than some of our high density. And that's the really good value of having this genetics is being able to really assess where these scallops are coming from, if they're from the hatchery. And indeed, for each one of these sites, we found hatchery scallops. So we're getting into the genetic data now, but really looking forward to further assessing that. Next slide. And so this was a little more of the explanation. We again swabbed the adult brood stock right after spawning and then collected the larvae prior to release for genetic analysis and then the spat, which you can see here in the vial and the six month post. Next slide. So this is just a, a graph of the actual hatchery identified spat from spawn five. We actually identified 15 of those being in the control site and with the high site about three and you can see again, not, not what we would have additionally expected from doing the density releases. We suspect that these sites were actually a little too close and the scallops could travel a little further than we expected. But the really great thing with using the genetics is we are able to actually identify that distribution. Next slide. So future work will really utilize genetics further to assess parentage analysis at all the sites and help inform future restoration efforts and scallop distributions throughout the bay and potential hatchery management solutions, effective population sizes for spawning and inform better management practices in the future. Next slide. And some considerations to make specifically is really monitoring seagrass health and restoration efforts that are continued, uh, the range and distribution of existing scout populations in the bay and where maybe a targeted approach may need to be taken, best restoration and management strategies, also their cost effectiveness if we're needing to do these in consecutive years, perhaps two to four years, or using a, a variety of different techniques depending on the needs and present population in the bay. Next slide. And I'd like to thank Tiber for funding this project and also FWC for helping assess some of the sites and of course our lab and volunteers. And I'd like to thank you guys for watching. I'd be happy to take any questions. We have time for questions. Any questions? <laughs> All right, I have to ask one then. Okay. <laughs> um, habitat preference. Are you, um, especially with larval uh, larval settlement, do you have any intention or uh, efforts to look at preferential uh, seagrass composition for 
a successful settlement of larvae. Yeah, absolutely. I think especially with the higher recruitment we also got at the first and the site five, that was more towards the southern part of the bay near the mouth where we had higher salinity, a lot better thalassia, thicker seagrass blades. So looking at those site preferences would be ideal. Um, as we did find more uniformity with Serengodium and the upper parts of Tampa Bay, although there were still scalps present, I think it would be much better to assess other seagrass areas if possible. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, no problem. Our next speaker is Savannah Hearn um, with FWC, I believe. Um, her talk will be on oyster density uh, on varying artificial reef substrates and elevations in Tampa Bay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Savannah Hearn. I work at the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute and Coastal Wetlands Lab. and uh, Today, I'm going to be talking to you about oyster density on varying artificial reef substrate and elevations in Tampa Bay. So we'll start with a brief history. Oh, sorry, my transition. So press it again. Um, a brief history of oysters in Tampa Bay. So in the early 1800s, there was quite a healthy population of the oyster reefs around Tampa Bay. They provided all sorts of economic and ecological uh, services, such as support to local fisheries, shoreline stabilization, things like that, but by the, the late 1800s, we had noticed that there had been a pretty big decline in those reefs. Um, in fact, by the 1970s, we fast forward and we've lost over 85% of our reef area. So we had gone from about 800 hectares in the early 1800s to about 140 hectares by the late 1970s. But luckily, by the early 2000s, we start to see restoration efforts appear in Tampa Bay. And like most oyster restoration efforts in the Gulf of Mexico, it focuses on providing hard substrate to compensate for natural reef loss. Next, please. So the goal of this study was to determine which artificial so uh, substrate for reefs and um, different elevations would be, would be the best to uh, support optimal uh, development of permanent oyster populations, ideally. So we have three different substrate types that we studied, and you can see at the top there. So starting from the left, we have shell bags. That's just a mesh bag that we stuff full of oyster shell. The middle is what we call an oyster reef ball. This is basically just a concrete dome that substrate can settle on. And um, the last, just loose shell. So you can see one of our quadrups just kind of placed. It's just loose shell on the ground. These are the three most popular types of substrate used in uh, reef restoration efforts in the Gulf of Mexico. So naturally we chose these for our study. Next one. Um, so you'll see here, this is, this is a map of our study sites. We have 19 oyster reefs across eight different locations in Tampa Bay. Um, the first thing I wanna kind of point out is this top left inset map. So you can see that red box is our, um, our Tampa Bay sites are there. That's most of our sites. But you'll also notice a little tiny blue box down there. Um, if you look really hard, that's our uh, our Perico Bay site, which you can see down at the bottom as well. So our site of Perico Preserve, that little yellow dot means that it's a loose shell site. So we can also see that there's a loose shell reef at Fantasy Island up in the middle. Uh, we noticed some shell bags. Those are those blue squares. We have 10 shell bag sites. That's the one we have the most of, and those are all over. We have a Matuti Island, McKay Bay, the McDill Air Force Base, where we also have oyster reef balls. Um, those are those orange triangles you can see. So we have three oyster reef ball reefs at McDill Air Force Base, and we have one on Fantasy Island as well. And then we also had some, some natural reef sites that we used as a control. We had three natural reef sites, and we have one up in McKay Bay, one over in Port Tampa, and one in the area we like to call the kitchen. So all of the artificial reef substrates that were used, so Obviously, a natural reef can't be constructed, but the ones that we did use were constructed in one of three time periods, so either between 2006 to 2008, those are our oldest reefs. Um, then we have 2015 to 2016, those are like our intermediate aged reefs, and then our youngest reefs were constructed between 2018 and 2019. Next, please. And again, so um, we had 10 permanent plots at each of our reefs that were monitored annually or semi-annually, depending on the age. So we had the um, the youngest reefs that were constructed between like 2018 and 2019, those were monitored semi-annually and the rest were just monitored annually once a year. We used real-time kinematic global positioning system to locate our plots because they're permanent plots. We're going back to the same exact spot each time. 
Um, so to, to locate those plots, they were either a five by five or a, a sorry, a 0.5 by 0.5 meter quadrat, which you can see in the top picture placed over one of our shell bags, or we did um, our oyster reef balls, which which are a little bit different, and I'll talk about that in a second. So to get that surface area that we would get for a half meter by a half meter quadrat, it's a little tricky to find on an oyster reef ball. So what we did was we used a, a surface area equation for a spherical segment without bases. So if you were to imagine a sphere and then cut part of the top of it off and then cut part of the bottom off, you're left with sort of that oyster reef ball shape. And then we can find from that the surface area like kind of calculated as a wedge or a slice of that remaining shape, what would be equal to like 0.25 meters squared. Um, just so we're monitoring the same area at each plot. So once we have our, our wedge kind of figured out, well, one of the things that we need to find that surface area is height of the exposed dome. So you can see in like the bottom example, I have 28 centimeters exposed. You put that into the equation and then that gives us a little slice or a little wedge of about 165 degrees. That's that shaded red area in the picture. So once we have that or our plot located, we can start to monitor. And when we do that, we count live and boxed oysters. So those are recently dead oysters that still have the shell attached, kind of like flapping on a little bit. Um, so we call those boxes or boxed oysters and we're counting and we're measuring those in live oysters for density. And we do this in situ. So we do this without removing the oysters because remember we're coming back to the same spot each time we want them to still be there. Uh, we also measure all sorts of other stuff like reef rugosity, uh, sediment burial, gastropod density, um, gastropod predator density, uh, things like crown conchs and oyster drills were the most popular that we saw on our reefs. So we also measured elevation and to do that we use our RTK GPS which I had mentioned earlier. You can see it in the pictures <laughs> a little bit. My, my buddy Scott is holding it right there on that red tripod. So we measure elevation relative to the North American vertical datum of 1988. And we do that with our RTK GPS and the coupled HC1 data collector, which you can see a little bit on the pictures right by my, my buddy's hand. Um, and we record elevation in every quadrat at a one hertz occupation or one second, they're the same thing. So we just stand there for one second and get elevation. Next, please. So the first graph we're gonna look at is oyster density. So we have mean live oyster density on the Y axis and we have average elevation on the X axis. And one thing that we're noticing, well, we have all substrate types represented here. And we also have um, error bars to show standard deviation of variability for all quadrats across all sites. But the first thing we notice, we have this like a layer of these blue dots over everything. Those represent shell bags. So we're noticing a higher density in general than the other substrates. So shell bags have a higher gen uh, density in general. We're also noticing that oyster reef balls, those orange dots down there, those are generally lower in density than the other substrates, especially at that lower elevation. So what I'm calling lower elevation is specifically between um, point, like negative 0.4 and negative 0.2, we'll call that lower elevation, and specifically very low there. But another thing that we notice is that all of the substrates are reaching their highest densities for the oyster reefs at our higher elevations, which I'll be referring to as higher elevations, sort of um, like negative 0.2 to positive 0.2. So right there in that area, you can see that all of our substrates are reaching their highest density right there. Next, please. So this is just another way that we're gonna look at the same data. So this is a generalized mixed effects linear model that we built in R showing the interacting influence of substrate type and elevation on oyster density. So we still have mean live oyster density on the Y axis. We still have elevation on the X axis and we're looking at the same sort of pattern. So you still see shell bags, which is that blue line, having a higher general density than the other substrates. Oyster reef balls, that orange line, that's a little bit lower than the other substrates. So we're still seeing that has a lower density and they're all still sort of peaking right between that negative 0.2 and that positive 0.2. Positive 0.2 is where we start to see kind of, it starts to kind of cut off. They start to diminish a little bit. And you see that there's only three reef types listed here. We did have to exclude the loose shell substrate types from these models because there was poor recruitment and small sample size. Next, please. So now we're looking at predator density. And what you can see here is that there's one for each substrate type, but they're also separated out by age. Now, um, I won't be talking about age because the patterns just weren't significant. So we're gonna ignore that for right now. But there is one for each of the substrate types. So I have shell bags, oyster reefs, 
loose shell and natural reefs. And another thing we're seeing here is that we're having quite a high density of the gastropod predators at that low elevation, again, that negative 0.4. Um, negative 0.2 to negative 0.4, and, and even lower. So we're still getting that, um, especially at the oyster reef balls. You can see that there's just a really high density of the gastropod predators there, uh, especially at that low elevation. But one thing we also notice here is that on the natural reefs, I have an have appointment on my schedule for tomorrow. It's so yeah, um, on the natural reefs. Sorry. Um, we're noticing at a, at that lower elevation, we're getting a very high, we have a very high number there. Our scale is a little different. So we had like something around 80 something gastropod predators at one of our reefs. Um, but again, one thing to just take away is that there are more gastropod predators at a lower elevation and that's what we're looking at. And this is a nice little picture of our oyster drill. That was probably one of our more popular types of gastropod predators at our reefs. Next, please. So now we're just gonna look at shell bags. And what we're gonna look at here is uh, so the top is oyster density and the bottom is shell height. So there's, these are still functions of elevation, but the, the top one we're noticing that as elevation is increasing. So as it's moving up, the density is also moving up, but as elevation is moving up on the, the bottom graph, uh, we're seeing that the shell height is decreasing. So we're seeing higher densities of smaller oysters at higher elevations and lower densities of larger oysters at lower elevations. Next, please. So this is just a nice graph to kind of help us explain why we're seeing these patterns, especially on shell bags. So this, this orange area is higher elevation, that's more upland. Green area is, is more towards the water, that's that lower elevation where we're seeing um, those larger oysters, but also um, smaller, smaller densities. And we're seeing that because well, when we look at it, it's closer to the water, we're getting more tidal influence, we're getting less subaerial exposure, less exposure to air, less exposure to heat, and we're also getting more time in the water for those oysters to filter feed. However, that increased tidal influence is also allowing us to see more aerial by sediments and um, more gastropod predators at those lower elevations. Now, if you look at the higher elevations, it's kind of flipped, right? So we're seeing more exposure to air, more exposure to heat, less time for filter feeding in the water, but you also have less opportunity for burial by sediment, and you're seeing less gastropod predators at those higher elevation reefs. So this blue zone, that's the more important one. That's that area that's more between 0.2 and negative 2. Um, that's our, our optimal growth zone, if you will. So that's that perfect balance area between those trade-offs of, of exposure to air, heat, um, feeding time, predation by gastropods, et cetera. So to recap, reefs at lower elevations are experiencing um, longer submergence, right? Because they're closer to the water, they're getting more submergence, they have more time to feed in the water, they also have less exposure to air. However, that longer inundation time means that we're seeing more gastropod predators, more burial by sediment. And I didn't include any of the sediment graphs just for the sake of time, but we did find significantly more burial at our lower elevation sites. So, next please. Uh, in conclusion, the things you want to take away from this is that higher elevation reefs have smaller but more abundant oysters. There is a relationship between density and size, and that's influenced by elevation. And associated factors that go with elevation that I've already mentioned, like exposure to air, heat, um, time in the water that allows for filter feeding, um, things like that. And all the information from the study should be used for um, planning future oyster restorations with anticipated sea level rise. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that came to help out. All our funding came from TBRF and the Environmental Protection Commission of Hillsborough County, Tampa Bay Estuary Program, Tampa Bay Watch, and FWC for helping us um, get this study done. Yeah. So I saw the two minute side, so I believe we have time for a question or two. Over here. Anyone else? Uh, we can do. Um, with your research, did you take into consideration diseases at all with oyster mortality or? Um... We didn't. Um, in this study, we did not. Okay. No. Wondering. 
Uh, in the site evaluations, did you make note of any predators of the predators? So I'm not totally familiar with like what would going after the oyster driller or the, uh, the conch, but were there just an absence in some locations of their predators? Um, sort of. We did notice a few instances of gastropods feeding on other gastropods. We have some cool pictures of that, but um, other than that, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Maybe one of my co-authors can give me a better answer. <laughs> I have one question. Um, oh, no. Go ahead. No, 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 you. Well, I was curious, and, I, and, and forgive me if I didn't catch it. Uh, it's hard to see through the slides from here. But with respect to uh, basic water quality parameters, in particular temperature and salinity. Okay, yes, yeah, so we, we were taking water quality parameters as but well. But was there a distinction among sites with respect to those water quality parameters? Um, salinity, I for instance. Don't, believe that there was okay so they have, they were all pretty much exposed to the same relative salinity at yes. any given time and temperature and oxygen. Yes. Chris? Uh, okay, so Jay stole my question, so I'm gonna make up another one. Great uh, <laughs> uh, what about uh, with respect to wave action and and fetch? So I, I I think I remember where your your boxes were, um, where your locations were, but I, I think yeah. The one in the northern part of the bay that was proximal to the shipping channel, right? So did you? Did, McKay did bay, that yeah, it's near it. We actually had um, higher wave action more towards McDill Air Force Base. Okay. Um, as well as uh, 2D Island and Fantasy Island, we had some loose shell sites that were there, and the wave action was just too good. Um, it was just way too much, so we couldn't get. That's why we had poor recruitment and small sample size, was because there was just okay. too much wave action. Thank you. We have to move on. Uh, thank you very much, Savannah. Uh, our next presentation, I believe, is, is uh, virtual or, or recorded. Uh, it's Tom Herter from the uh, Mobile Bay Estuary Program, and he this talk will be following watershed management plan recommendations to eradicate the island apple snail from the Langdon Park Lakes in Mobile, Alabama. This morning, I'm going to talk briefly about our ongoing efforts to eradicate our iconic invader, the island apple snail, Pomacea maculata, from the lakes at the city of Mobile's Langen Municipal Park. Thought to have been introduced through inadvertent aquarium releases in the early 2000s, they have since infested the park's lakes and moved downstream from this source through Three Mile Creek to the lower watershed where they threatened to transform the productive seagrass beds of the Mobile Tensaw Delta into a mud desert. The state's prime directive has been to keep the snails out of the delta. This is the Three Mile Creek watershed, stretching east across northern Mobile to the University of South Alabama, Langen Park, diverse city neighborhoods, the lower watershed, and then to the Mobile River. In 2014, its management plan was published, identifying an abundance of apple snails as a major ecological challenge. Responding to this challenge into plant invaders like popcorn trees, wild taro, and Chinese privet, the Mobile Bay NEP secured restore funding to publish the Three Mile Creek Watershed Invasive Species Control Plan in 2019, a prescriptive guide to controlling the snails and the gamut of invasive plant species in the watershed and across lower Alabama. This is a Google Earth image of the Langen Park Lake system, from its upstream confluence with the headwaters of Three Mile Creek to the complex and crenulated 13-acre upper lake, which serves as a reservoir and water supply for the golf course, over the earthen dam and spillway, and down 7.5 feet to the 27-acre lower lake, the hot spot for snails and eggs, then over the main coffer dam and again to the main stem of Three Mile Creek, east towards the river and delta. With the City of Mobile having secured funding to dredge and restore the lakes, eradicating the snails assumed increased importance. In 2008, park visitors began noticing garish bubblegum pink egg masses around the lake's perimeter. Adult female snails emerged from the water, usually at night, to lay the eggs opportunistically on any surface that supports their weight, including trees or cypress knees along the island's shoreline, emergent vegetation like southern wild rice, cattails, or even alligator weed, 
or on any available infrastructure like bridge pilings, PVC poles, culverts, or sheet pile. The State Conservation Department, Wildlife and Freshwater Fisheries Division, began efforts to eradicate the snails in 2009 and then again in 2015. Wildlife and Freshwater Fisheries not only address snails in the Langen Park Lakes, but also downstream in Three Mile Creek to Telegraph Road. Treatment components included volunteer efforts to scrape eggs from substrate, using herbicide to control or eliminate shoreline egg laying opportunities, opportunistically collecting and destroying adult snails, and treating the water column with copper sulfate crystals and copper carbonate liquid algicide as direct molluscicide control agents. Trapping indicated reduced numbers, but snail populations remained robust. With normal activities curtailed in early spring 2020 by the COVID pandemic, MBNEP staff sought to implement the Invasive Species Control Plan and began intensive manual efforts to remove eggs from shoreline vegetation twice weekly. We used bamboo poles along the shoreline and paddles from canoes and kayaks. With snail eggs hatching in one to two weeks, this protocol aimed to reduce new snail recruitment. City parks employed herbicide to reduce egg laying opportunities. Volunteers were recruited to walk or paddle, helping us beat down the eggs and vegetation on which they were laid, and opportunistically collect adult snails from the water or in thick submerged aquatic vegetation for destruction. The city dug holes behind their facility, which we filled with a day's harvest. With young and old staffers beat up from intense and repeated efforts in June, the MBNEP contracted Osprey Initiative to continue the manual protocols through the snail reproductive season in November. The Osprey team continued manual removal protocols, collecting adults, walking the shoreline, and paddling around the islands and wetlands. Over the duration of the 2020 protocol, Weekly results, reflecting two collection efforts each, trended from an average of more than 4,400 eggs removed and 880 adults destroyed from April through July to a steeply declining average of 1,700 eggs and 370 adults removed weekly from August through November when the snails entered their winter dormancy. With the City of Mobile advancing plans to dredge and restore the lakes, the NEP got serious about eradicating the snails. In fall of 2020, we distributed a request for qualifications to contractors to undertake comprehensive snail abatement efforts. These included continuing manual protocols consistent with 2020 efforts and also employing subsurface applications of a selected molluscicide compound targeting juvenile and adult snails while, to the extent possible, avoiding by-kill of non-target fish and aquatic non-molluscan species in the Langen Park Lakes. With several highly qualified firms submitting statements, the American Sport Fish Hatchery Team from Auburn, partnering with the Osprey Initiative Team, was awarded a contract to get to work in late winter, early spring. American sport fish had unique ideas about vegetation management, emanating from their lake and pond management experiences. In March 2021, as Osprey resumed the manual protocols established the previous year, American sport fish continued the city's efforts to treat vegetation with glyphosate to eliminate egg laying opportunities, both from the shoreline and from the lake's wetland areas. With the lake choked with nuisance SAV, even making navigation difficult, an attractive component to ASF's statement was using herbicide to eliminate it prior to applications of molluscicide. The team deployed a shallow draft motorized vessel to conduct herbicide applications beginning in March and molluscicide applications beginning in April 2021. The molluscicide chosen to control the apple snails was proposed by several of the applicant teams. EarthTech QZ is a rapidly dispersing, immediately bioavailable copper-based compound that works at a significantly lower copper dose than copper sulfate or chelated copper products. It was touted for its specificity.
American sportfish hope to reach an effective concentration of up to five parts per million, but the alkalinity of the lakes caused some concern to the team, hoping to avoid bikehill. With repeated applications performed at multi-week intervals through the reproductive season, the five part per million threshold was frequently approached, absolutely no fish kills were observed, and dead snails were collected with increasing frequency. Weekly snail and egg mass collection counts reveal the effectiveness of the strategy thus far. From 2020, weekly peaks of more than 5,400 eggs and almost 1,450 adult snails were removed and destroyed. In 2021, weekly data showed a peak of 1,781 eggs on the first week of the effort and almost 400 adult snails collected in one week in midsummer. Average weekly counts of snail eggs destroyed averaged 2,855 in 2020 and 297 in 2021, an almost 90% reduction. Average weekly counts of adult snails destroyed averaged 590 in 2020 compared to 121 in 2021, an almost 80% reduction. Educational signage has been installed around the park's lakes to raise awareness of the problem. Have we successfully eradicated the snails from the Langen Park Lakes? No, but data reveal we have dramatically reduced population numbers in the lakes. As February rolls into March, the same team will employ the same protocols to hit the snails hard and repeatedly when the water warms enough for them to become active. We hope the effort provides a model for managing these invaders, and we will even undertake similar efforts with the same team downstream in One Mile Creek, where in 2021, egg masses were frequently observed on invasive wild taro. We appreciate you letting us share our experiences with you. We think we're headed in the right direction, and we'd be excited to discuss our efforts with you should eradicating island apple snails become a priority for your organization. Thank you. We are going to move to our next uh, presentation, which is my good friend Ernesto Lasso de la Vega with, uh, hold on one second while I present him. Ernesto is a biologist who's worked at Lee County Hyacinth Control District for the last 30 years. He's been a uh, technical advisory committee and citizens advisory committee board of the Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program, now the Coastal and Heartland Program for the last 10 years. He also, he also represents Sarasota Baywatch as the clam restoration coordinator. He's an avid volunteer for so many uh, environmental restoration projects. Uh, please welcome Ernesto. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for staying and I'll be, I promise I gotta be short because we had to go to the beach. And I apologize for the jacket, but this is a meat locker. Right now I'm just having a, and I don't want to be shaking here. So move on. So the title should be lessons learned. So just add that lessons learned on this restoration project. Next slide. And, uh, oh yeah, good. So we started Sarasota Baywatch. By the way, it's Sarasota Baywatch is a citizen action community of volunteers who do action, they do collect, they do activities. So we are started, we started historically with the clam, um, I'm sorry, scallops. We started the scallop restoration. We put a lot of baby scallops, we put a lot of activities, but then we realized scallops are very sensitive, sensitive to salinity, low oxygen. They cannot tolerate the red ties and they live for a short period of time. So the next, um, for us, the next slide, please, we learned that the Mercenaria campensiensis, the southern hard clam, is tougher. It's tougher. They can, they're native of Sarasota. In fact, they used to be in large quantities, but they have been eliminated by overfishing and the water quality conditions has not been suitable for these clams to grow. But they're tolerant to red tie. They have great filtration ability and they can live up to 20 years. So we thought that this is a better uh, tool for doing restoration and also to clean up the bay. Next slide, please. So this is a video, and since I have a little time, let me present to you, let's see if the sound works, and if the sound doesn't work, it doesn't matter if, no, no, go back to the slide and hover on top of the Sarasota logo there. Yes, 
There's no music, but it's supposed to be music, but we have technical issues, so no biggie. This is an activity that involves all the citizens and the students. These are high school students who come to, start to Pine Island where the farmer is growing our clams. We have paid this farmer, yeah, this farmer. We, claim, we pay him to raise our clams. We go collect these clams and we move them to Sarasota to put them in places where we want. Here, we move them in a truck. I mean, this is a cooler truck from, from a, yeah, but be your trucker. And this is, a, this is a video that a lot of uh, citizens see this, say, oh, I can do that. They definitely like to do that. And this is simple. So they volunteer, they bring their boats. We put these clams in a barge, which is also a donation by another company who can provide these boating facilities. And we put about, what, 60,000 clams at, a, at the time. Whoa, everybody there. These people are excited about these things. So we go and we dump these clams in locations where we know that there used to be clams. Now, we learn because sometimes we're dumping it right on the mountains of clams. So now we're learning that to spread them out in a certain area. But nevertheless, this is the first time that we were doing this long time and we're learning. So they said the ending of the clams, the video, it's just a short video. You use these videos to excite the communities. <laughs> It's fantastic, yes. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> so this, we started with looking at maps from Moat Marine, 1992. They are located all the clams locations. So we're going back to those sites because that's where the clams were. And we're looking at maps, also the seagrasses maps, where the clams are not, where the seagrasses are not there. We want to put the clams there because the clams might in suit make the soil available more suitable for the seagrasses to grow we had that in mind for for future uh, for our future places to put these clams next slide please and the sites are some of them are bad if you look at the organics in there they're anaerobic there's nothing except for drift algae so we don't going to put the clams there we go to sites where we find clams the soils are good there's plenty of these clams already, other type of clams, including predators, because the predators will say, I'm not gonna be here, it's another food. So there are gonna be signs, there are gonna be the signs for us to say, hey, this is a good place to put the clams. Next slide. And then now, instead of dumping the clams and shooting them and piling them, we have an area where we determine exactly where we're gonna be putting the clams and later on assess if the clams are doing fine. If they're surviving, if they're growing, and so 50 by 50 meters, 62,000 clams, and they're about an inch, an inch and a half, and sometimes even bigger. But because that size, they're the clams are just growing, and they can reproduce, which is the best of all. I'm not caring so much for the clam, you know, filtering. It's the reproduction because that's what we want. And at then then at that density, 25 clams per square meter, they're suitable to eventually reproduce and be able to grow more clams. Next one. So first one we call it because we have been just buying the clams, moving the clams from Pine Island and releasing them in Sarasota. We did the releases 220, uh, 90, 93,000, a million clams we already have put in the first last year and the years before. So now we just got fundings for the next batch of this year we're going to be putting another million clams in there in locations in sarasota um next slide please so the cost of this well you had to buy the clams from the hatchery you had to pay the farmer and that's what we did in in previous years and then we had to harvest them moving them into sarasota next slide that's the kind of the cost of the whole activity but we have in-kind contributions by the farmer the hatchery the donation of the uh, of the boats and all this stuff and it's a whole list that it adds up to ninety seven thousand dollars of in-kind contribution now that's where we are solid about that everybody who's providing you know this kind of effort to do that so it is a cost but this is the side uh, the the in-kind contributions um yeah next slide so the phase two we are going to be the first uh, group, Sarasota Baywatch, who is going to have a lease, an aquaculture lease for restoration of clams in Sarasota. So instead of 
build uh, uh, growing clams in Pine Island, we're going to grow them right in Sarasota, where we can move them as we dispose where they're going to go. And so that's the first lease that is going to be coming for our purpose of a restoration of clams. Um, four and a half acres, mesh bags, and we're being helped by the, next slide, by the Gulf Shelf Institute, Gold Shellfish Institute, who's also providing us the knowledge of how to do this. Um, how long time? Time is good. Okay, good. So, so we're purchasing those baby clams. We put them in there, and we're going to raise them up to the size where they can protect themselves because the size is important for restoration. Um, and then we're going to apply for this special activity license by the Fish and Wildlife Conservation, and then put them in the places where we want. Next slide. So lessons learned, we got to put these clams in places where they're not so shallow because the citizens who are fishing and um, your recreational fishing will fill up our clams and take them away. No, we had to put them in deeper places where there's no easy access to them. Uh, 25 clams per square meter, that's the density that normally in places where they are growing, we find them, that's a good density. Um, delineate the area so we can go later and assess if they're doing fine. Um, using the maps of Moat Marine to see if we, they were, we're going to put them back again in the place. Um, and then the DNA hat, the, from the hatchery. So we have that information. So when the babies come, we can track them back to their parents and say, yes, we've done it. Because that is their babies from the same group. Next. Additional benefit. And there's a whole list here. And I'm going to go through that. You can read it in the poster if you want to approach me later. Um, but there's great opportunities. Utilize the clam for algae reduction. Yeah, mitigation red tide. Yes. Combining the clams with restoration of seagrasses. We believe in that. We're doing an excellent study with the Gulf Shellfish Institute to prove that and to have the evidence about that. And so again, this lease is going to be a, a research station as well, because we're going to be putting a, a studies there. Opportunity for students of higher education to do that, supporting aquaculture. We buy the clams from farmers who have probably problems with red tie. They cannot sell the clams. So we buy those clams because nobody's going to eat them, and we're going to put them for restoration. What a great deal. And it, it's, yeah. Oh, that's it. Time's up. Oh. <laughs> Get out of here. And helping conservation, we have the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation in, in Sanibel. They wanted to do clam restoration. So we're providing them some clams to start up the projects. Uh, scientific underwater activities, uh, 2 million gallons a day with a million clams. What a great deal. And we're excited about this, and we cannot stop. So we're going to continue. Time up. No. What questions then? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one question over here. We have another question over here. Another one over here. Ooh, ooh. So get ready. Get ready. Shoot me. Well, let me get the microphone first. First one with a microphone. Oh, ask a question. We, we have a microphone over here. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, I have a couple questions. First one is regarding um, your permits to release, because uh, you know in the IRL we have a project with clams as well. However, they're they're uh, restricted to releasing only repatri repatriating only at commercial clam lease sites. Former. So how did you get a permit to release them pretty much anywhere? The Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission they have to grant you. And then you had to delineate where you're going to be going and putting the clams. So that that's our already have we have that permit for next year. We had it for previous years. Every year you had to update that, and you tell them where they're coming from, what is the nature of and the species and everything. So yeah, the fish and wildlife are keeping an eye on us, and we have to carry those permits every time we move the clams. Is that a special activity license. Special activity license, correct. And then Bob, have you seen any um, crown conch predation at all? Oh yeah. In fact, not the not the queen conch uh, is the the whelk. Oh, whelks are every the tort. The, yeah, the lightning whelk. Oh my goodness! But it's good, you know. If they have to eat, they have to eat. I don't care. This these guys. Yeah, I don't care because those are. I mean, we're supporting other creatures. Even the stingrays. We Mode Marine is doing a job, a project where they're putting the sensors, the acoustic sensors to. To hear when the stingrays come and crunch, crunch, crunch our clams. I know. But again, you know, these are all the creatures that 
you know, they survive, they live out of this. Oh, a question. Is that all? Uh, over here, please. Yes. Um, my question is sort of twofold. So did you do any sort of like water quality monitoring to see if the clams improved that? And then <clears throat> if you did see improved water quality, were you going to look at um, implementing the scallop restoration? Because I know you said they were a little bit more um, sensitive to harsh environments. Well, the water quality has not been because, again, we don't have a lab, although we depend a lot of the water quality from the water atlas. I mean, and it's the county. The county continue doing monitorings on the water quality. But that's not our, our, our main main thing. Uh, the scallops, we have seen scallops that has come back in some areas where we we put the clams and yes, but not at the huge quantity, but we are looking into that. Yeah, that. in fact, we have an activity called a scallop search in our year. We do, we establish a scallop search with, uh, with the help of uh, the NEPs. So we do that kind of activities and we're gonna be monitoring those. Thank you. One, one more question, I believe we have someone over here. Hey, I was just wondering, first of all, this is a, an awesome project. Um, I was just wondering how you monitor for success and how frequently you monitor for success. Excellent, great question. In fact, that is the, the, the bottom line here. We have, with the help of um, Gulf Shell Fish Institute and also independent uh, um, consultants, they're gonna come onto the sites where we have put and do exactly that transit, find out how much is the densities, because we have to prove, okay, we put the clams last year, are they still there? How many are there? Are they growing? Yes, that answer has to be there for the citizens because they're putting a lot of money on us. And the trust comes when we have the evidence to prove, okay, this is the density. And we're learning if there's less density, okay, that's part of the data. And we're just gonna put more clams maybe to increase the densities or I don't know, we have different strategies for that. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, we're gonna That's, it. Our That's it. I, I know you stole the stage, but we need to have <laughs>
They don't allow light to penetrate down to the seagrasses, so it has a negative impact on water quality overall and on the seagrasses. So that's obviously not good. So we're starting to explore different mitigation strategies to try to mitigate those blooms. So the management strategy I will present on today is using shellfish as a restoration tool. So we know that shellfish... All right, can we hear me now? Yes, okay, perfect. So yeah, so shellfish are efficient grazers. So the idea is that the shellfish will be able to clear the pyridinium from the water column at rates faster than it could grow. So we did some preliminary work a few years ago where we exposed oysters to a non-toxic algae, to pyridinium alone, and then a mixture of the two. And we compared their feeding rates after four days. So in this figure that's gonna magically pop up, um, the feeding after one day is in blue and after four days is in gray. So observations we made here were that the oysters cleared the non-toxic algae at rates greater than on pyridinium. However, when looking at pyridinium exposure alone, there were no significant differences in feeding after being exposed for one day or four days. So although they were grazing pyridinium at a lower rate, they were still effective at moving it from the water column. Which leads us to our study question for this project is, can oysters be an effective long-term mitigation tool for pyridinium blooms in Old Tampa Bay? A main concern is wondering about the long-term health of the oysters. We want to know, will they keep feeding after this prolonged exposure? Will they stay healthy? The metrics we used to answer those questions was looking at the clearance rates or the feeding abilities of the oysters and using oyster condition index as indices of health. So today I'll be talking about the methods for clearance rates and using the other information to help supplement our results that we found. All right, so we collected all of our oysters from Booth Point, which is a natural reef in upper old Tampa Bay area. We had two cages deployed at our control site in Baybro Harbor, which will pop up in blue. And then we had five cages deployed at our exposure site, which is in a known area block a rope tethered through to a buoy so we could easily identify it on one center cage we had um, a YSI data sawn in a c3 fluorometer that was continuously collecting data every 15 minutes so that we could use okay and at deployment we had about 80 oysters in each cage so we tracked the entire pyridinium bloom throughout 2021, and we used our different metrics to do our analyses at different sampling dates and at our different exposure or different sites. So our exposure site, we sampled for 12 weeks. At the end of July, we observed a lot of mortality in our oyster cages. So we just simply didn't have enough oysters to continue the experiment. So we had to pull those cages. At our control site, we had a red tide bloom enter Tampa Bay. So our control oysters were exposed to brevitoxins and that's the red tide toxin. So those were no longer considered a suitable control. And due to those unforeseen circumstances, we continued our sampling at Booth Point, our natural reef, which does have pyridinium exposure at it. And we continued throughout the duration of the bloom, looking at toxins and did a final analysis of oyster health and feeding ability at the end. So the last picture that popped up is pretty much what we would go do every week at the exposure site. We would remove any crabs or fish that wiggled their way in, um, defoul the cages, service our instruments, and collect any oysters that we needed for experiments in the lab that week. So for an example, if an oyster was going to be used in a clearance rate assay, we would bring the oysters back and defoul them, allow them to purge their guts for 24 hours, and, and um, yeah, the next day they'd be ready for their clearance rate assay. So we had five jars per treatment, 
and we'd put one oyster in each jar, allow it to acclimate for 30 minutes. As soon as it opened its valve, that was our time zero. And we added a known amount of pyridinium concentration into the jar. So we took subsamples after 15, 30, 45, 60, 90, and 120 minutes. Thank you for progressing these. I'm sure it's stressful for you. <laughs> um, so yeah, so those subsamples were preserved and counted under the microscope. Those cells were, the abundance that we counted were used to create an algal decay curve. So we could see the decline in cellular abundance over the two hour time period. We used the slope of that decay curve to calculate our clearance rate for each individual oyster. And again, we had five reps per treatment at each of those duplicate, each of those sampling points, they were collected in duplicate. And we took observations about the open or closed status of the oyster at each time. And then on the screen, it might look like it was a very peaceful experiment, but in reality, we had 10 timers going off, literally hundreds of vials. So it was always a really fun days in the lab and we got to have lots of bonding time. So to look at our results from our control rate experiment, so on our x-axis is our sampling dates, y-axis our clearance rates, our controls are in blue and exposure in red. Our secondary axis, we could see the pyridinium cell concentration at the exposure site over the course of our sampling period. So we observed that there were no significant differences between the control and exposure site clearance rates in the first seven weeks of the experiment. Additionally, we observed that there were no significant differences in the clearance rates that were a pre-bloom concentration or during the bloom. So even though the pyridinium concentration had increased, the oysters were still feeding at comparable rates. All right. And then to give an indices of oyster health, we looked at condition index or the internal shell capacity of the oysters. Again, control is in blue, red is exposure. And here we observed that there was a drop in oyster condition index in the month of July. And additionally, we saw a lot of mortality in the oysters cages in July. So that was what was occurring in the field. However, we looked down in the bottom in the lab, the clearance rates indicated that the oysters were still feeding efficiently. So we are trying to understand why the oyster health declined. So we looked at our environmental data that was being collected at our exposure site. We focused on June and July and overall trends we observed was an increase in temperature, a decrease in salinity and intermittent periods of hypoxia. So these are all within the physiological range of which oysters can tolerate. Um, so because of that and pyridinium exposure, um, we could not attribute the decline in oyster condition index to any of the factors that we had on hand. So remember, we lost our exposure and control sites, so we ended up going back to our natural reef to follow through the experiments. And we looked at the condition index before the bloom happened and after. There was no significant differences between the pre and post measurements. There was a decline during the bloom, but they were able to resume their pre-bloom levels. And also we looked at the toxin level within the oyster tissues. So in the top panel, we can see the pyridinium cell abundance over the course of the bloom that we started sampling in green. So we see an increase in pyridinium abundance, which is mirrored in our bottom panel, which is our saxitoxin level or the tissue toxin content level. So they kind of follow the same pattern. As the pyridinium abundance increased, the toxins also increased, but as the bloom subsided, the toxins also declined rapidly. And by our last sampling point, there was no toxin detected anymore. So revisiting our initial questions, were the oysters able to continue feeding? Yes, they still fed on pyridinium after their long-term 12 week exposure. And the toxin depuration occurred quickly and our oyster condition index were restored to pre-bloom levels that we observed in our natural populations. So those were the questions, answers to our questions for our research experiment. However, there's still a lot of questions that remain revolving around implementing 
a restoration of this sort, like understanding the transfer of toxins within the food web. So if we have toxic oysters out there, organisms are eating that, what does that mean for the food web? Trying to understand the sublethal effects of saxitoxin exposure. So how will it impact oyster recruitment or reproduction abilities? And then trying to figure out the size, scale, and type of restoration effort that would be needed to truly make an impact in the associated um, ecosystem benefits and risk with that. With the information we have currently, we can start creating modeling scenarios to assess the feasibility and potential impact that a restoration effort could have. And it's important to note and acknowledge that this action is just one of the potential actions that can improve water quality in Tampa Bay, but it'll likely require a multi-action approach to try to minimize chlorophyll A and these blooms in the bay. So as a concluding note, we do have posters, of, as you've heard, in the Grand Central Room seeking feedback on this proposed management action plan and others as part of our actionable science grant with NOAA. The whole point of that grant is to seek stakeholder feedback to make the most informed decision for Tampa Bay. So we value and appreciate your feedback and I will take any questions. For one question. Once. Well, sir, let me ask one then, since nobody. Sure. Uh, everybody. Um, so I know, I know it's really tough when animals don't cooperate with experiments and the like. Um, so you're still assessing the potential for um, using oysters to mitigate uh, these toxic uh, uh, paridinium blooms. What, what are your next steps in terms of trying to uh, answer that uh, challenging question? Yeah, so I think the next steps is we have these raising rates and we have pyridinium growth rates and we have other information about like nutrient loading in Tampa Bay. So trying to like model different potential scenarios that to understand the impact that the grazing could potentially have in addition to the nutrient loading, so which are causing the blooms to increase and just trying to figure out all those pieces to understand what impact could potentially be made if that answers your question yeah, it's a challenge one no doubt all right um that concludes this session um do you have any uh, announcements uh gary